بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم tonight is uh, we've scheduled this uh, for a few months ago and i know times have changed and things have changed but i'm still here inshallah planning to do this talk and um, was excited about this um, sharing this journey with uh, it's a parenting journey that my wife and i had we have three older boys now they're all men my youngest is 19 my eldest is about to be 26 and uh, i grew up here in the united states since i was three years old so i grew up on these movies i grew up on disney and one of the things we realize now is that disney is one of the most powerful media conglomerate companies in the world it wasn't at the time when i um, was a kid and uh, it's gotten more and more and more powerful and we know that it's not just uh, entertainment, but it's entertainment that has a purpose. Everything is uh, done with very, very specific messages, with very, very specific scripts, uh, the motions, the feelings, the emotion, the music. It's all very, very scripted and very, very intentional. And so as I was uh, raising my children and experiencing movies when I was a, ch when I was a child and uh, going through the emotions of uh, seeing movies and films and what they uh, had, how they had effect on me in different ages and what I was able to do. Um, when I had children with my wife, we were very intentional about what they were watching. And so we kind of became research buffs about what are we gonna allow our children to see and what are we, why are we going to allow certain things to be seen and why are we going to allow certain things not to be seen and um one of my uh earliest memories the other thing is that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is very generous and when we started our parenting journey there were many um elders in my community that i admired a lot and i watched them very closely and my wife watched them very closely we sat down with them we asked them questions and they shared their parenting journey with us and uh, so we're very, very grateful to those folks. And I'm not going to embarrass them by mentioning them by name. because They wouldn't want me to do that. But uh, because we've gone through this parenting journey now, and mashallah, we have this experience, um, we want to go through and share the prophetic sunnah of being generous and sharing our story, sharing our journey, and hopefully it'll help others. So um, like I said, uh, Disney now owns Pixar. It's a very powerful conglomerate. It owns Pixar, it owns Marvel, it owns Star Wars, uh, it owns Miramax. So it, when it doesn't want to associate itself with adult content, it uses Miramax for a movie company. Uh, also owns ESPN now. So I've followed ESPN since the beginning. I was a kid when it came out, and I see that ESPN has changed. It's about clicks, it's about narratives, it's about messages, just you know, sort of selling things rather than actually analyzing sports it's it's changed and and as disney gets involved it changes quite a bit so um i'll just share a couple of interesting stories about my first exposure to media i was five to six years old and um my first exposure to television was asking my father why 363 people had committed suicide in guyana and it was all over the news so there was this uh people's church called jonestown and my first experience was, you know, finding out about this person, Jim Jones. And I was very curious about it. You know, I was sort of trying to understand what's going on. And my parents and I had a little bit of conversation about it. And I asked them, you know, Dad, why are all these people sleeping in the forest during the middle of the day? Because they kept showing these helicopter shots of this jungle in Guyana and all these people asleep, you know, laying in the grass, laying in the forest. And he said, Beta, they're not asleep. They're all dead. And I was, wow. I was like, wow, this is fascinating. Why would they die? And he said, they followed this person. And they followed him to the point where they started a church. And uh, they went out there. And then they got more and more scared about the fact that the world is ending. And they all decided to cook this Kool-Aid. And the adults gave it to the children first and then drank themselves so in our uh, culture, there's this thing about called, it's called drinking the Kool-Aid. It's when you just drink something, so somebody gives it to you, and it's, it's actually referring to Jan Jonestown. And so I was very, very fascinated. So there's a couple things that I, re I learned just from this media exposure. I learned about false prophets. I learned about uh, another church. I learned about um, end times prophecies. And I learned about suicide. 
just as a kid. These are all my experiences in my brain. I was very, very fascinated with this stuff. Um, the second uh, exposure that I had was um, uh, this, this Indian Bollywood movie that was coming out. And my parents and I went to see it. It's called Hare Rama Hare Krishna. And it's made about Hare Rama Hare Krishna is the chant of this cult. And so another, another exposure to cults when I was a child. And uh, the one thing that really, uh, I haven't gone back and watched this movie. I actually intend on going back and watching this movie. But this movie was very traumatic to me. Because the beginning of the movie, there's a family with a boy and a girl, mom and dad. And they have this montage and the, and the parents have this terrible fight and they break up and get divorced. And as I'm experiencing this movie with, as a five-year-old without parents talking to me about it or anything, no discussion about it, there was the first exposure I had that it was possible for a family to be split into two. I didn't even know what divorce was. I didn't know it was possible for a parent, a mom and a dad to split up. I thought, you know, families are families, they're a unit. And I was very, very disturbed by it. I never talked to anybody about it. And I remember the whole movie. I would just couldn't concentrate on the whole movie. I don't even remember what happened. I know that the girl uh, went to a cult in, uh, in um, uh, she went to a cult in uh, northern India, in Nepal. And then the brother goes to try to save her. You can see the picture there. And uh, the next time that my parents had a disagreement, it was in the kitchen a few days later, I was freaked out. My little heart was beating out of my chest. I remember so much anxiety, so much stress. And uh, I started to really, really just every time there was any kind of friction between my parents, I, fro I freaked out. And I realized that, you know, the, the different ages that you're exposed to different media have intensely different effects on you. So as I go through my talk, I want you to think about having a five to six year old boy or a girl a five, a nine-year-old boy or girl, and a 13-year-old boy and a girl, all experiencing these movies and these messages that I go through with you. So I'm going to go through the different messages and what they mean to the different ages. Um, and so, so this, was, this was my first experience with media. The other one that's funny story is I remember Richard Nixon stepping down. I, I, I just remember him saying, I'm not a crook. And, and I was like, well, the president can, can be put down too. So there's a lot of things in the small human brain that go on that if they're unanswered or you're not talked to, you know, you can't reconcile them. You just sort of make snap judgments about things. So the next uh, 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 slide is I'm going to talk about six major themes. This is a survey of Disney over the last 80 years since it's existed. Um, I went back, back and studied some of this stuff and um, I was uh, aware of some of these things, but as time has gone on and as I've had children, I've seen things intensify. And the messages get more and more bold. So let's go through the through the six themes uh, pretty quickly. The first theme is uh, oh, let me cover Disney. So uh, Disney is uh, shown as a family man, a good family man. He had a family, but if you go and research Disney and people who actually lived in his house, the unapproved uh, biography of Disney, uh, it is told that he had night terrors. He walked around the house screaming. And then at some point, um, he spent most of his time in the Disney theme park in his old age. Uh, and he spent, he was obsessed with Pirates of the Caribbean. That was the last ride that he actually built himself and supervised being built. He spent a lot of time doing that. So I researched that. He was a failed writer and a director. He tried to direct normal films. And he was obsessed with that 11 to 13-year-old girl who was his uh, protege. And he wanted her to be an actress. Uh, it's easy. Sometimes it's easy to find these things online, but they get taken down. I watched some of the scenes and it was very, it seemed very inappropriate because she was the actress in the script that was written. It was a very poor quality movie, poor writing. And she was winning all the arguments. She was kind of like a girl that was above her age. And so I, I saw that this man was obsessed with the, a girl that, it seemed inappropriate. That was his protege. And he was a failed writer and director. These movies flopped. They didn't even make it out of the studio. You know, they, they ended up in the floor. They ended up in the vaults. Um, but he did have genius. He came up with a technique uh, to print cartoons frame by frame, but he moved the background at the slower pace, and then he created a middle ground, and he created a foreground. And so 
with that animation and with the films being done on clear paper, on clear plastic, the three different levels, uh, and matching the story to voice and music, he was able to create something that had never been seen before. And his first big hit was Steamboat Willie. It was 1930s. Um, and he matched uh, song, sound, and motion of animated characters to this small film, and he called it Steamboat Willie. And then Disney was such a success, they decided to do a full feature length film after that, and they branded Willie to Mickey Mouse. So that's Mickey, Willie became Mickey Mouse. So this is a, the other thing is he created um, characters out of inanimate objects. So the steamboat had eyes and a face and smiled and tooted to the music. It was really kind of, at that time, it was very, very cutting edge. And then he used that to build a studio to get the money to do Snow White, which was his first full feature film. Okay, so here are the themes. The first theme that we notice is the trauma of parental loss. Okay, you could see it in the movies a lot. It's kind of there, and I noticed it. You know, Cinderella doesn't have a mother, right? Um, Sleeping Beauty, uh, uh, no, so um, there's, there's a list, there's a list. So theme one is the trauma of lost parents witnessing the death of a parent. So Bambi actually witnesses a forest fire and his parents are, are burned in the forest fire. Um, um, and then the, uh, I went through the list and looked at some Christian websites that look at Disney movies and sort of, you know, give uh, advice to parents about the Disney movies and the messages. And that's where I get a lot of this content. But you had Snow White, who didn't have a father, uh, a, a mother, um, Cinderella, Bambi, Dumbo, Little Mermaid, uh, Beauty and the Beast, Belle, uh, Aladdin, Jasmine, uh, Lion King, he loses his father, Hunchback of Notre Dame is uh, raised in the, in the church uh, by a religious elder, uh, Brother Bear, Tangled, she has parents, but she's actually being raised by a woman who claims to be her mother as a witch. Frozen, she loses her parents, the sisters lose her parents. Finding Nemo, doesn't have a mother. Uh, Moana, Moana, no, sorry, not Moana. Uh, Mo, uh, and, and I think, um, so there's some movies that have two parents. So Moana, Mulan, and Brave, they have multiple parents. So this is the trauma of lost parents, but it's not just the lost parents. It's the fact that the parent who actually is the biological parent isn't caring for or involved in the life of the child. The stepmother does it, or, or they're under complete neglect, or the parent is very, very strict and overbearing. So there's extreme strictness, uh, as in King Triton. Ariel experiences extreme strictness from her father. Um, you know, he doesn't understand her. And beginning of the movie, you know, she is singing about a world that she wants to be in. Uh, neglect from the existing parent, and they've married a step-parent who's cruel or wicked or wants to, uh, you know, doesn't wish them well. So Cinderella has stepsisters, right, and a stepmom. The tipping point for me when I realized this was a really dangerous theme was when I watched Lion King. I said, oh, wow, this is another level. And the reason is is because not only does Simba, the, the, the boy king, uh, witness his father's death at the hands of his uncle, but then he goes to the body and he sits with the body and he cries and goes through this full arc of emotion with the music and with all of the animation together with it. And when I witnessed uh, Lion King, and you know, when I watched the movie, I realized this has gone to a completely different level. It's, it's, it's amped up. And uh, I was very careful about when my children were watching it. Because I was like, you know, this is not the same as what happened with the kind of movie that I experienced when I was younger. So that to me is a tipping point. And I think this uh, theme is really important for your children that are under the age of six or seven. They're a lot more innocent. They're a lot more dependent on their parents. So if you have a nine-year-old and a 10-year-old or a 13, 14-year-old, this theme is not as intense for them. But that child who's younger um, has to be reassured after the movie that, you know, if this, what do you think about this? If this happened to you, what would happen? You know, auntie and uncle would take care of you or, you know, uh, your other parent would take care of you. We wouldn't leave you to another step person who's cruel. Like you have to not let that child go to bed with those emotions. Like I said, 
my experience with the Hare Rama Hare Krishna was I was terrified and I never told anybody. I went through several days or maybe a week of intense anxiety because of that. And so we have to be aware our, as our adult brain that we're in charge of this little brain. The fitra is very raw, very, uh, I just very cute girl looking at me here. She just distracted me. But yeah, the fitra is very raw. And so they have to be um, looked at and, and talked to about this. Um, I'll move on to theme two. So theme two shows up in the very first movie. It's magic and sorcery. The first movie is Snow White. Everybody, everybody knows mirror, mirror on the wall. The stepmother does not care about Snow White, um, resents her. And as Snow White grows more and more beautiful, um, the, the generally it's known by the mirror that she is gaining beauty and the stepmother is getting older and she resents her. But there's clearly magic going on. There's sorcery going on. And um, the second theme, the second image that you see there is is called Night on Bald Mountain. It's actually in the second full feature movie that Disney did, and it's called Fantasia. And Fantasia is a movie about eight different songs and eight different themes. It's a very operatic movie. They sort of created this music and the songs. It's eight different themes. Uh, one of them, the pictures that you always see, is Mickey Mouse in a sorcerer's hat. And, you know, he's, he's called the Sorcerer's Apprentice, and he has to train himself to become a better sorcerer, and he has tasks to do. So one of the things is that he has to clean up the attic, and he uses the two brooms. You know, he doesn't want to do the manual labor, so he he's working on two brooms, and he's trying to get them to go into the water buckets and then dance for him, and it's all done to the music. That's all good. That's the image of Fantas Fantasia that they want you to see. This night on Bald Mountain is terrifying. The little white things that you're seeing in the foreground are actually very emaciated human bodies. If you look really, really closely, they're emaciated human bodies. And one of the scenes in Night and Bald Mountain is that this is a, if this is a soul-stealing demon that is um, going around in the middle of the night in their small villages and a volcano, and the soul-stealing demon actually has these bodies coming out. It comes out as smoke. But within the images of the smoke, there's bodies. And then he takes the bodies and they dance in a circle in the smoke. And then he casts them into the lava cavern, into the volcano. So if you haven't seen this movie, it's quite, quite intense. And it's the second movie. Um, the second movie also, you have uh, uh, fairy magic. I'm talking about the themes that are in different movies. You have fairy magic, nature spirits, spells, uh, witches and warlocks. Genie and Jinn, you know, everybody knows about Aladdin. That's a Jinn. Uh, spirits, um, objects that come to life and help, um, demons and temptresses. So the, the most famous uh, sort of temptress, which is Ursula in, in Little Mermaid, and they just remade that movie. Um, so Sorcerer's Apprentice, Knight on Bald Mountain. The Beast has a spell on him. The spell can only be broken. Uh Sleeping Beauty, she's under a spell. Uh, Snow White, Mother Mirror Mirror. Uh, Hunchback actually talks to these statues that come alive in the castle of Notre Dame. His friends, he's very lonely. His name is Quasimodo. And it's based on a classic novel. But they took the classic novel story and they Disney sort of appropriated it. And now the, the Quasimodo is having conversations with spirits that live inside of statues. And those are his friends. Uh, so magic and sorcery is very good. I also went to a, a, a Christian website and looked at it, and they had a list of about 50 Disney movies that had magic and sorcery in it. So they're normalizing the fact that you can gain power in the dunya to get the things you want by uh, means of magic and sorcery. Seher. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so we talked about A Little Mermaid. Little Mermaid has Ursula. And, of course, you know, Robin Williams is a gen. He's a genie, right? Um, even in Moana, she has, uh, she follows her grandmother's spirit. The, her grandmother passes away, and then you can see her spirit as a stingray that guides her to leave the village. Um, controlling the elements is big in Moana, because she has the, the sea is very dangerous. She experiences almost near death when she just goes out and sea by herself. Second time she goes, the sea is now her friend, so the very, very dangerous elements become friendly. 
Um, and then, of course, there's Maleficent. We'll, we'll talk about Maleficent and supernatural powers. And there's a lot of fairy stuff in Maleficent. So that is a uh, theme. That is theme two. All right. We're into theme three now. Oh, oh and uh, again, if you're thinking about a five to six year old, a nine to 10 year old, 13 to 14 year old, you know, this is probably the age. This affects the age of imagination. The age of imagination is more under the age of 10. So you would be concerned with those two children rather than your teenager. Uh, although now there's a lot of witches stuff on YouTube. You can go and figure out all these people who have YouTube channels that will teach your teenagers all kinds of spells. Unfortunately, that's that's the reality of open source uh, videos. Um, so I do want to make a comment about each age group as I go through. Um, the third one is peril and punch. I'll, I'll, I'll define my my title. So moments of extreme danger, fear, injury, death, capture, kidnapping, imprisonment, punishment with no end, and constant worry. So um, the reaction of the beast in this image here with Belle, um, her father wanders out to do a task and gets captured by the beast who trespasses. And then she goes out to help to find her father and she experiences this beast. So not only is he completely volatile, dangerous, and mad angry, but he also threatens to kidnap her forever. Right? She has to, in order to free her father, she has to be imprisoned in his castle forever. So that's punishment with no end. Cinderella, same thing. Cinderella, she's going to stay there. Her stepsisters are going to uh, prosper in the house while she lives with the animals, you know? Her name is actually Ella, but she lives in the cinders, so her name is called Cinderella. A Snow White, of course, she runs away from this wicked stepmother who's obsessed with her beauty, and there's magic going on, and then she ends up with the dwarves. Um, uh, sleeping Beauty, uh, let's see, she's going to sleep forever. Punishment with no end. Uh, Frozen. Uh, Frozen, because she has power, she's afraid that she'll affect other people, so it's cold death. Uh, hunchback, um, he's forever locked up and not, you know, he's considered a freak. Um, the Good Dinosaur is one of the worst movies I've ever seen. Uh, it's this uh, dinosaur named uh, Farlow, and they show him as a very klutzy part of his family. He's very, he's already very on edge. He's just not normal. He's not brave or anything. And then him and his, his father forces him, hey, you know, you have to man up and come out with me. And he witnesses his father die. In a, in a collapse of the side and he drowns in a river and the entire movie is Farlow basically facing death and dismemberment or bite, bitten by bugs or snake or falling or dying. The entire movie is peril and punishment. It's one of the worst movies you can show your children. There's no point to it. And uh, I went and watched it and the other thing I realized is that it's again he's, he experiences the death of his father, watches it not just sees it from afar, but he, he emotes it. Um, so peril and punishment is, is really intense and it affects the younger ones. Even, um, when Belle goes to save her father, she just, she's just going through the forest at night, but the forest comes alive and the trees are tentacles and they're about to tip over her wagon and she's about to be grabbed. So she's almost kidnapped by the kidnapped and killed by the forest before she ends up in the castle of the beast. So it's like, it's 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 slam it's a uh, double whammy on double whammy punch on punch and your children are experiencing this as adults are kind of yeah that's that's really intense wow but then your child can be terrified so we have to look towards these these young hearts and what they're going through especially when we're allowing them to watch these movies with us or um, you know we're allowing them to view these movies because yeah you know they're rated G they're Disney let's it's all right it's okay just you watch this while I do something else. That's not what we want going on. So theme four, we're getting to some really good themes. Um, the tipping point. Oh yeah. I wanted to mention this too. The image that I have is uh, tangled. It's a Rapunzel story and it's remade by Disney, but instead of just being locked away by a mother who resents her, she's actually imprisoned by a witch who is staying young by the energy of, of Rapunzel. And so that's another, um, They've made it worse than the book was actually 
done. So they, they, they make it more intense. And she has a song called uh, Mother Knows Best when she's just terrifying the girl into just stay here. Don't even think about going anywhere. You're a klutz. You'll go out. You'll die. You'll, be, you'll have a thief. There's a whole song that goes on. It's called Mother Knows Best. Theme four. Okay, this is uh, the absence of any adult helpers. Okay, so we live in a, mashallah, community where we have large families. We have aunts, and uncles, friends, cousins. Um, when uh, we go on hajj as a couple, you know, we talk to our uh, brother or sister-in-law and say, you know what, if something happens to us, we're going to get a will. And then we're going to ask you to take care of our children if something happens to us on hajj, if we don't come back. And we have community, we have mosques, we have charities, uh, we have orphanages. Um, in Disney movies, no, there's none of that. There's no adult helpers, there's no relatives, there's no community members that are upstanding and moral. There are no leaders, there's no ethical people, there's no upstanding citizens. Um, Simba has an uncle that just caused the death of his father and then wants him gone. Um, in, in Hunchback of Notre Dame, Quasimodo is the ward of a religious leader. He's the bishop of the church and, uh, you know, he's confined to his, um, he's confined to the church to be locked up. And again, he talks to those friends when the adult isn't there, those animals come to, those toys come to life for him. And then Dumbo is really interesting because Dumbo loses her mother. I mean, Dumbo loses his mother. And this scene that you're actually seeing the picture of, I remember, I don't remember the movie, but I do remember that the Dumbo has these ears and the different elephant mothers who are sitting there in the circus, they have other children. They're deciding whether they want to take Dumbo in. And they actually gossip about, gossip, gossip about Dumbo's ears and why he's not normal. So even the adults that are there that are considering taking the, the, the character in are terrible adults who gossip and then they reject him. So he has to fend for himself with his friends, the other animals that are in the circus. Um, and there are good characters. I mean, there's a, there's a chipmunk that runs a circus that, you know, helps him. Uh, Ariel has Sebastian the crab who's afraid of Triton and tries to say, you know what, you should stay home and not mess around, not do the wrong thing. Um, Pinocchio has uh, uh, a friend who guides him to write. So there are these characters, but they're not listened to. So um, this, is, this is a very uh, theme that actually affects the younger ones again. The, the 13-year-olds and 14-year-olds and your children, you know, they kind of understand. Their, their brains have evolved beyond the imaginative world. But the younger ones definitely have to be reassured when you see these themes, especially when adults are not acting in the best interest of the characters. Um, let's see my notes here. So that's theme four. We're going to get into the most interesting theme now that really, really uh, pervades a lot of the a lot of the Disney movies. Um, individualism. So this is the theme that is probably the most pervasive. And my title is individualism, freedom from obligations, rules, tradition, running away is best, um, tab going towards the taboo because you know better, uh, because it'll give you uh, the chance to do the things that you want to do. Um, running away with, uh, you know, you know best to be with enchanted beings, uh, party or uh, partner up with spirits, pets, um, the ocean, the elements. You look for reckless adventure. Um, you don't care about your responsibilities and you break family and obligation rules. So that's individualism. And um, Jasmine, you know, she leaves with a thief, right? Aladdin's a thief, but he's got a flying carpet, so he's pretty cool. Um, Tangled, she leaves with um, Finn Rider is the character. She actually, he's so unintelligent that she apprehends him very quickly. He can't even escape her. She's smarter and better than him. She uses her hair to tie him up, you know? And then the interesting thing about uh, Finn Rider entangled is that it's very clear from the characters that his horse is smarter than he is. One of my favorite characters in Entangled is the horse. And Finn Rider says, go this way, and the horse will roll his eyes and 
the Rapunzel and the horse will know, yeah, we need to go that way. So even though you're an individual, you're going to leave with the worst losers, the thieves and the losers. Ariel, of course, um, she's supposed to reject the world of men and she, she pines for it. Her opening line um, is that uh, she says, I don't get why my father doesn't understand. I don't agree with my father about uh, how he feels about men. And she says, how can the world that creates all these neat things be terrible? And she's in a shipwreck. She sees coins and things like that. You know, she's actually sings about a taboo. She's, she knows it's taboo. And her first opening song is about part of your world. It's called part of your world. She wants to be part of their world. And then when there's a man, she, the song changes to part of your world. Um, Let's see, individualism, Bambi, you know, he goes off with his friends after his parents die. That's kind of innocent, um, but it was a lot more innocent. This theme has gotten more ego-driven during the newer movies, more sinister and more ego-driven. If you're thinking about, you know, your children, sometimes you have the child that's spirited, you have the child that you're strict with. They get the message that my parents don't understand me and I have friends who understand me. And there's always a little buddy character in the movies, you know, the little fish in Moana. She's got the little scared chicken. Hey, hey, his name is Hey, hey. Um, and so they, they kind of just talk themselves into going out with this buddy. But that buddy is just kind of a sidekick. Uh, sometimes a buddy's a, a, a good luck charm. Um, we're in the age now. Uh, this is another parenting talk. And the parent told me this. I wrote it down. We're in the age where authority is always being questioned. And individualism reigns supreme. That is the age we're in. And these messages are going into your children. You know, it's, it's a slow, slow seep. I'm not saying that all these movies are bad. I'm not saying you're not going to watch them. But I'm going to say that you have to, the talk is about viewing them with Muslim eyes and viewing them with the responsibility that a parent should have over the fitra of their children. Those, that's, that's really the goal here. That's really what I'm trying to share. Um, it's not that they're all evil. I've enjoyed these movies for a lot of my life. I laugh. Uh, I enjoy some of the characters. Um, so that's theme five. Um, and I want to talk about theme five a little more because I want to highlight some of the songs. Um, the songs are, you know, so, so brilliant. Uh, so Ariel starts with, I just don't see things the way he does. I don't see how a world that makes such wonderful things could be bad. And she starts, I want to be where the people are. I want to be where they're laughing and singing. You know, she doesn't have legs. So that's her main message. She's already inclined towards the taboo. Um, she disagrees with her father's uh, interaction uh, or, or, or co uh, command to stay away from men. Uh, Moana, she says here, I wish I could be a better daughter. I wish I could be a perfect daughter because she's supposed to take on her tribe. Um, but I come back to the water no matter how hard I try. So she's singing about the fact that I know I have responsibilities, but this thing keeps calling me. And she says, I know I need to be a perfect daughter. Then she says, see the line where the sky meets the sea? It calls me. See the light as it shines on the sea? It's blinding. One day I'll know how far I'll go. So while they're showing that she has tradition and she has responsibility, her song and her emotion and the, is towards, I'm, I'm, I, I'm holding back, but I'm going to go there. I'm going to go there. I'm going to feed my nuts. What I want to do is eventually going to happen. Um, Elsa's famous song that, you know, if you, Halloween time, every girl you ask is going to be Elsa wearing the frozen costume. Her song, her main line when she runs away from her responsibilities is no right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. And as they time the song, she climbs this imaginary stair, which keeps building as she steps. And then her last step is her right foot. She says, I'm free. And this castle appears before her. So the message is really tuned to the music. It's just, it, it's, it's so... Um, brilliant in its in its messaging. You know, you have to 
read the lyrics of the music after you've seen the movie. So Moana, I felt one way about the song while watching it. There's that, yeah, she's trying to be responsible. She's trying to be good. Then when you read the lyrics, the lyrics are just like, I, I'm, I know I'm going to get out of here. I know my ego and my individual is going to win. So I really wanted to take the time to talk about that theme. Um, theme six. Theme six is an important one. I learned this from Dr. Leonard Sachs. He has two books. One is called Boys, uh, Boys Adrift. The other book is called Girls on the Edge. If you have children under the age of 10, boy or girl, please buy these books, both of them. They're just so invaluable. And I've learned so much from Dr. Leonard Sachs. Um, and he uh, came up with this phrase. I knew it was there, but really, really defined it. And when you define it, you start seeing it. It's called moral inversion. So this is the theme of moral inversion. Always taking what society and our rules have is right and doing the exact opposite. And uh, Leonard Sachs talks about the video game Grand Theft Auto, where if you drive, if you steal a car, you get 100 points. But if you steal a car and you run over a lady with a cane and then you kill a cop and then you run through a store and kill more people, you get a thousand points. Right. So this is where the the moral inversion is accentuated, where they're sending a theme to you. You should be doing the wrong thing. Grand Theft Auto is a very, very terrible game. It's about a Russian gangster who comes to America with no money and you're role playing. You gotta make some money. You gotta take over the gang. First you take over the Russian gang, then you take over the Italian gang, then you take over the Asian gang. And you just get better and better and better. It's it's a game version of Scarface. Right? And so um moral inversion, I've got these images here. So Elsa, if you look at Elsa here, she's wearing a beautiful dress, her hair is perfect, she looks perfect. She's not in the previous part of the movie, she's buttoned down very matronly. She has responsibilities. But once she leaves her responsibility, she has this major, sorry to say, this glow up. <laughs> her eyeshadow is all of a sudden shaded purple. I'm sorry I noticed this stuff, but it's crazy. It's really crazy. I'll show you the other image of Elsa afterwards. Um, Ariel, she decides that she wants to be so in the world of men that she's going to sell part of her. She makes a deal with a witch and Ursula is a two timing witch because Ursula resents her father who's King Triton, the king of the oceans. And Ursula knows, Hey, I can get this girl and I can destroy her father and then take back the kingdom. And she's so two timing that not only does she do a deal with the girl, but the girl uses her voice to attract the man. She says, your price is the voice. So like the woman is left with no voice. And she says, what am I going to do? And she says, oh, men don't like it when women talk anyway. You know, it's really, really interesting. Um, Ursula is, is a very two-timing character. And then, you know, moral inversion. We've got Jasmine who runs away for adventure. You know, she has this adventure with the genie and the gin. You know, make it all look really funny. Ha ha. Robin Williams and his one joke a minute, you know, um, he was a depressed man. He killed himself, you know, and, uh, they, they make this stuff look like adventure and fun that it all turns out. Okay. Well, let's see. Uh, always doing the opposite of what is moral and right. Do the taboo, the forbidden, the dangerously tempting, be rebellious and be talked into doing the wrong path. There's always a, one character that says, maybe, you shouldn't do this. But that person is doing it out of fear of King Triton, not because saying it's the right thing to do. That character doesn't tell them no. The character says, you know, do it out of fear. Right. Um, don't just go against moral. Go against your parent. And not only parents, but some of these parents are tribal leaders, kings. And Triton happens to be God. He's like the god Neptune. God with a little g. Sorry to say that, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have a little a. There's only Allah. But with God, the word you have, God is goddesses. Those are all little G's. Um, yeah, go against the, the authority figure. Um, let's see. Rely on nature spirits also. You know, it'll be okay. Um, there's many levels of re rebellion and moral inversion. And the other thing I wanted to say is these themes kind of 
are layered on top of each other. So Belle doesn't have any adults to help her get her father. Then she has peril and punishment in the forest. And then she has the extreme danger of the beast. So it's multiple layers of multiple themes layered together. See, let's see what I'm saying. It's, it's not just one. All the themes are kind of compacted and layered together. Um, yeah, so Ariel, she has no mom, a strict dad. Okay, so that's theme one. Uh, she dreams of that taboo. So that's individual. That's theme, the, theme five. Uh, she goes it alone with a sorceress. That's t theme two. Multiple themes all in the same movie, all in the same character, all woven into the same a narrative. Um, a bell, her father's kidnapped, so there's no helpers. Peril in the forest, imprisoned for life, um, having to do a deal with a beast so that her father can be free. She doesn't have anyone to rely on. Moana, she goes against the tribe. She follows a spirit. She argues uh, with a selfish male god named Maui. Um, she relies on ocean magic. And then there's pagan nature and earth goddess at the end of the movie. So these are multiple themes. So these are my six themes. There's four more themes that I was doing this. I decided there was going to be four more themes that I wanted to add to this. So there's a modern agenda going on. And as these movies are have these themes in them in and of themselves since the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, the new modern movies, I wanted to highlight the three modern movies. Um, and those are pushing modern agendas, four potent messages that are now woven into Disney's offerings. So we've got Moana there. We've got Maleficent there. So, I mean, tell me, if, you, if you're driving home one night and Maleficent suddenly levitates in the front of your car, most people would probably have a heart attack right there on their steering wheel and run into a tree. It's really, really scary. When I first saw this poster before the movie came out, I was I just stopped in the movie theater. I was like, what is that? This two-horned black beast. What is that? How can they make a movie out of this? I just, I was so confused. I, I couldn't believe it. All right. And then they use uh, so-called beauty queen, Angela Jolie. I was like, wow, double whammy. Here we go. Let's, let's, let's figure this out. So then the movie comes out and, uh, you know, uh, I, I looked at a Christian website and there's a woman called Christian Kids Mom. That was her handle. And she wrote, she watched Maleficent and she wrote in her blog, I wrote this down. She said, um, I know Maleficent is a demonic looking character, but as I went through the movie, I could not stop being more and more and more compassionate to her cause and identifying with her plea. Like you walk in and you see her in the first scene and then they build the whole story and the narrative of how she's protecting the fairies in the forest against the men armies and this, that, and all this stuff happens. In the end of the movie, you're sympathizing with this character, you know, and this is, this is the mind flip that, you know, uh, Shaitan doesn't have a lot of tricks, but within the tricks that he has, the sophistication is very, very powerful. Um, so I'm going to go through these themes. The first theme is the patriarchy. Okay, We've got male characters now. In Sleeping Beauty and in Cinderella, the prince was good man. And he wanted a princess. He wanted a queen. He wanted to rule his kingdom well with a wife. That was the prince. Now, in Frozen, Prince Hans is a deceiver. He wants to take the he wants to marry Anna, the sister, because he wants the kingdom. He has an alternative agenda. Um, the bishop here, uh, his agenda was to keep Quasimodo away from the gypsies. There's a whole gypsy family with a beautiful uh, gypsy girl named Esmeralda. And he's used, he realizes he's using his power and he's doing it for his own nupsy game. Uh, Mo, the, and then, you know, we've got the demigod here. His name is Maui. He's in Moana. And he sings about how he brought the islands up from the ocean and the clouds in the sky and the sun from the stars and all this stuff. He has a song called You're Welcome. It's actually a really funny song, uh, enjoyable song. But the message there is that he is a god, but he has limited power. And at some point, he just, just there's a crisis on the island. And the story begins with 
this male god, he doesn't care anymore. He lost his hook. He lost his power. He's like, yeah, it's fine. She has to go out in the ocean and try to save her village and the, and the, and the, and the, um, the, the, her society from starving. Okay, so that's, this is the patriarchy. These are the male figures. They call it the Homer Simpsonism of dads. You know, dads are these doofus characters who babble, and they're always like, oh, dad, you're so embarrassing, you know? Not male figures, not people who, you know, really know what they're doing, who are going to command the, the room and who do things for the right reason. And you trust them. That's, that's, that's the modern world. The second one is the supreme feminine. So, mashallah, we know the feminine is supreme. Women are able to give life. Women are able to nurture. Women are able to give the initial food. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made women. I mean, we, we men are in awe when we see our wives have children. I just like, what just happened? <laughs> How did you do that? And women are able to hold the baby and say, yeah, I want another one. And I'm like, wow, I'm still in shock. I'm trying to deal with the first baby. I want another baby. Women are the supreme, right? But this is in the competition and in the arena of men. Okay. Maleficent has to protect the fairy. She's going to go against the world of men, the armies, the castles, the, the armor, the blades, everything. Um, in this one, Moana, she takes a front seat. The male god has to follow her lead. And he's afraid. He, he loses his hook, then he gets his hook, and then he's going to help her, and it's about to break, so he's afraid he's going to lose his powers. He takes off. She has, to find the, she has to fight the final battle herself. This is really interesting. And this follows the other theme, which is, I don't need no man. Why do I need a man? I can do this myself. Well, you know, families are built with two people. Yin and yang, we have male traits, female traits, and we appreciate each one. We know we're different. We're equal partners, but we're different. We have different roles. Um, so this is the Supreme Feminine. Okay. The theme three, new theme three, is the toxic masculine. Of course, right? Prince Hans, he just wants the kingdom. He's greedy. Uh, in this case, you see Elsa there. This is Elsa buttoned up when she's got her, before her glow up. Right? This is her buttoned up when she's got responsibilities. She's supposed to take care of her sister. Um, the male that's in the picture with Maleficent, you know, he falls in love with her. They have a thing, and then he steals her wings, traumatizes her, you know, because he wanted something else. You know, he just used her. It's very, very terrible. And then the last picture, very disturbing picture, uh, is the bishop. He's looking into a fireplace, and in this scene, he actually sings a song called Desire on Fire. And he sees Esmeralda in the flames of that fireplace. And she's not clothed. This is hidden in the mess in the in the in the in the visuals of the of the movie. My children did not watch Hunchback of Notre Dame. We we realized this wasn't the movie we wanted for them. My 26-year-old son, I asked in preparation for this talk, I said, have you seen Little Mermaid and Hunchback of Notre Dame? Because we were clearly like, we're not going to have him see this movie. He's like, no, I haven't seen them yet. He hasn't seen the movies. My younger one, 19-year-old, he's like, yeah, I've seen I've seen uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame. I turn it on. You know, he's 19 years old. He can watch what he wants now. He's a man. But uh, we were very conscious of doing this. Um, and there's frames. There are famous frames in Disney movies. I'm not going to name them here. But there's frames that are intentionally... If you stop them, you'll see something that you don't want to see, and Disney allows it to be there. They're famous. You can go on the web and find them, but I'm not going to mention them here. I've already mentioned one, and I regret it. Uh, the last one is climate catastrophe. Children are being told by politicians, by the green movement, that they're not going to live to see 15 years in the future or 20 years into the future. And these themes are also being done into the movies. So... Um, Frozen has the, the concept of cold death. She has a responsibility. She runs away. She knows her town is going to freeze to death, but she doesn't, she doesn't look back. Um, so there's this constant uh, part of the story that everyone's going to die because of climate. And then in, the, in Maleficent, the armies are deforesting. 
They're, the men are just greedy. If they want land, they just want to cut it down. They just want to take the wood. They want to burn it. They want to make metal. They want to make cat, catapults. Like, you know, whatever they're going to do, right? It's the, the, the world of men is going to consume the nature. And in uh, Moana, she goes to the pagan Mother Earth Island to save it. She actually goes there. So this is a climate catastrophe kind of theme that's in the movies, woven into the movies. Um, I'm going to end with some parenting tips, uh, things that work for us. We as parents need to be aware of the different ages, the effects on the ages. If you want, please take a picture of this slide. This is not from me. This is from people who guided us. Um, we're now in the world of multiple screens. If you have four people in the house, you probably have 12 screens. If you have a car, sometimes maybe you have a 15 screen in the car, you know, so each person in the house can have three screens. They can have a phone, an iPad, or a computer. The number one thing that I would say, and again, we cannot say no to watching these movies. These movies are part of our culture. We're in the West. Our children are going to enjoy these stories and, and, and consume them. But we need to consume, we as parents need to consume these stories with them and guide them and be aware of the different ages that are affected by the different stories and different themes. So number one, consume the media together and discuss with open-ended questions. If you sit there and watch a movie like Ariel and go, oh my God, she did this, she did that, while the movie's going on, your children are going to check you out. Let them enjoy the movie. Don't destroy the movie for them. But afterwards, ask the different, ask the kids, did you, do you think she did this right? Why did she do that? If you don't let them talk, you're not going to know how they think. If you talk over them or talk at them, you're not going to learn anything and they'll check you out and then they won't learn anything. So the number one message here, I put this at the very top, is to talk to them with open-ended questions at the appropriate age. So climate catastrophe is not something you talk to a five-year-old about, but you can definitely talk to them whether the man is bad or not. You know, you can tell them whether this prince was really, uh, did he have good intentions or not? Um, all movies and TV or view with the family until the age of 13. A lot of parents are worried that these are not popular rules, but the parent has to be the parent. Your kids are going to have three, 400 friends in their life. Um, and they're only going to have two parents, two parents that really see them from their purest fitra age to the age of discernment to 16 years of age. 16 is about the age where it's like, you've got to start to sort of let go. But every parent that I know in the recent past, the battle for the phone keeps going at a lower and lower age. Now I have a friend who called me and said, I just gave, I just gave my phone to my 13, my 12 year old is about to be 13 and I'm having a lot of problems. I regret it. Everybody that's done it younger than the age of 15 or so. And I've talked to them has, has regretted it. They're, 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 you get, you get fooled by their physical size and their ability to have logic, grammar, and rhetoric, but they're still toddler adults. A 13-year-old is a one-year-old adult, two-year-old adult, three-year-old adult. They're still toddlers. They're trying to figure it out. So they're not, they have the rhetoric. It's like, mom, this is for safety. I got to do my homework. I need the internet at school. But there's all these reasons. They're really good with the reasons, but they, they are still toddler adults. They don't, they have to have parental guidance to manage these things so that they can continue to grow. So inshallah, this is what the talk is about is to help and to guide. And most of the Disney stuff is more princess oriented. It's more girl oriented. Guys don't really get into this as much. Um, the internet, shut it off, shut it off at 10 PM. Just, there's no, there's no reason for it. Uh, especially on a weeknight. I realize I'm getting into Isha here. Uh, she, Hadi Amar's here. And, uh, I just wanted to end asking for you for your duas. Uh, this is an addiction. Uh, and, uh, you have to keep your children busy because right now the default for non-busy children is screen time. The screens are available, they're accessible, the internet is not charged by the minute, it's affordable, and has all these things. So, so I just wanted to end with uh, three other characters that I have. This is more towards the boys. Um, I also grew up with comics, 
and I'm very much into these comic book movies, and there's some very interesting themes, so I'm trying to now work on another presentation. Uh, the gentleman on the left is named Apocalypse. He's from the X-Men movie. It's called X-Men Apocalypse. Um, and then there's Ultron, who's in an Avengers movie, and then there's Thanos, who is in the last two movies. So I want to end now. We're going to have Adhan for Isha, and I want to thank you all for coming. Inshallah, make dua for me. Uh, inshallah, keep our family and our community in your duas, and my duas are with all the young ones. Assalamu alaikum.